Okay, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, okay. I'd like to thank, uh, thank the organizers for the invitation to speak uh, at this workshop, and also the Hausdorff Institute for providing those wonderful work conditions here. I mean, it's really a very nice uh, place to be. Uh, okay, so what, okay, so what I'm going to talk about is okay, it's the Finetti's theorem. So it's actually. Uh, So it is, uh, it is very much related to what uh, Anatoly Vershik talked about in his uh, seminar talk a couple of weeks ago, if you were here. Uh, if you were not, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, so the Finetti's theorem. Okay, so what does it say? Uh, so basically this, uh, this theorem, it tells you, okay, so if you look at uh, say the action of S infinity on uh, to the n, yeah, so you have S infinity acts on the natural numbers, right, and just by permuting the natural numbers, and then you can produce an action on 2 to the n just by permuting, permuting the coordinates. Uh, and then you ask this uh, very natural question, so what are the invariant measures? On 2 to the x. Yeah. So, okay, maybe I'll try to define actually everything. Okay, so mu is a measure here is invariant yeah if for all subsets a to the n when you move them by an element of g the measure stays the same yeah this is for all g in uh, in s infinity and uh, well it is a standard fact called the ergodic decomposition theorem so ergodic decomposition which tells you that you only need to care about the ergodic measures. You only need to care uh, Okay, so what is, uh, I mean, what does ergodic decomposition tell you? It tells you that every invariant measure decomposes as an integral of ergodic measures. So if you understand all the ergodic measures, this means that you automatically understand all measures just by taking appropriate integrals. Uh, okay, maybe I should also say what is what is ergodic. Okay, so mu is ergodic. Okay, so if uh, so by definition every new invariant set A has measure. Zero or one. Uh, okay, no, okay. Let me tell you. Okay, let me tell you now what new invariant is. So this means that. Okay, so this means that for every g in well in our group, when we take a and we take the symmetric difference, so we move. Yeah, we move the set a by g. Okay, we maybe don't obtain exactly the same set, but we obtain something which is. Uh, measure zero. Somehow the, the difference is uh, only measure zero. And uh, it is very important to take uh, this definition, okay? Because otherwise uh, everything fails uh, very miserably. So if you're, if you're used to, to classical ergodic theory, there one, one can replace, the de in the definition of ergodic, one can replace this mu invariant by invariant. So if, you, if your group is locally compact, for example, then here you can just take invariant sets. An invariant set is just a union of orbits of G. And uh, here you cannot do this. As actually, so there's this, uh, well, this example of Kolmogorov, which actually doesn't have much to do with the rest of the talk, but I still think it's a, it's a good thing to keep in mind. I suppose Anatoly also has a whole paper about, oh, about this example. Uh, so it's actually, okay, it's very simple. So what are, what are some, some invariant measures here? Okay, so let's look at the measure mu p, which is just the measure p one minus p to the n. Okay, so this means that you put one with probability p, uh, zero with probability one minus p in every coordinate independently, right? So this is, uh, this is a Bernoulli p one minus p measure. Uh, okay, so it's easy to check that all of those measures are ergodic. Yeah? p is just some number between zero and one. So all of those measures uh, are ergodic. 
And then you can look at this set AP. So this is a subset of 2 to the n. So this is OX and 2 to the n, such that uh, the ones, so this is a sequence. So you take all the sequences where the, the ones have density P. OK, so let me write this down. So this means that, uh, well, we take the limit as n goes to infinity. And then you count how many ones you have up to n. Yeah, so this is i smaller than n. And then you divide by n. Yeah, so this is just the density of the, of the ones. So that you take this number to be equal to p. Okay? And those are clearly the set APs are all disjoint, right? I mean, the, the AP, well, you can write it. You can say AP1 intersected AP2 disjoint for P1 different from P2. Right? Because the density is something that you can determine from the, uh, from the set. And now what is, what is clear? So the law of large numbers tells you that so law of large numbers Uh, tells you that uh, mu p concentrates on a p. Now this just means that mu p of a p is equal to one, right? I mean, you know, this is exactly the the statement of the of the law of large numbers. So here everything uh, so, so far is all right, right? I mean, so we have different ergodic measures and they concentrate on uh, different sets, on these joint sets. This is how it is supposed to be. Uh, but then there is this uh, thing which is slightly disturbing is that uh, O A P, well, for P in the open interval, 0, 1, uh, live in the same orbit. Right? Because, so what is the orbit? I mean, the orbit is just you have the set of x's such that there are infinitely many zeros and infinitely many ones. And obviously, if you have two such x's, then they're in the same orbit. There's a permutation that sends one to the other. Uh, so you have, I mean, a single orbit on which you have those continuum many sets. So each of them supports an ergodic measure, and all the measures are invariant. Okay. So this is somewhat disturbing when you see it for the first time, but then I suppose you just get used to it. <laughs> uh, maybe I add one uh, as well. stated yet, okay, maybe I should also tell you what the Finetti's theorem actually says. Okay, so uh, it says that, so those mu p's, p in 0, 1, are all invariant ergodic measures. Uh, okay, and then, so actually, I need a sl slightly more general version of this, which is more or less the same. So look at, uh, so instead of looking at 2 to the n, let's look at the interval 0, 1 to the n. Okay. And then uh, the answer is that, okay, so the, now we look at somehow the set, so it is nu to the n, where nu is a measure, probability measure on 0, 1. And then the same thing, yeah, are all ergodic invariant measures. Uh, so this is, you see, I mean, this is exactly the same as before because uh, this number p, this is, I mean, if you want this interval 0, 1, this is the set of all measures on two points. 
right? This is the set of all measures. So here, instead of on two points, we just look at the set of all measures on this. Uh, and then it's, I mean, the, so the result, the result is the same. And I suppose, well, this version is due to Hewitt and Savage. And then uh, all the initial proofs of this were very complicated, I think mostly because they did not have access to the ergodic decomposition theory. Right? So to prove ergodic decomposition, you need Schuchess theory, and Schuchess theory was not available at the time, but which made things very complicated. Uh, all right, so now we want to do, what we want to do is we want to generalize. And to generalize this, this theorem to, well, more general situations. Uh, all right, so what is a more general situation? So we had uh, this S infinity acting on N. So I'm just going to replace this by G acting on M. Okay. And then, uh, well, then this gives rise to an action of G on 0, 1. To the M, right, just by well, the same way as, uh, as before, some M is a countable set. Okay, and then the, the problem, yeah, problem remains the same. So what are all problems? Is what are the invariant measures? And let's put ergodic, right? I mean, so what are the ergodic invariant measures? Uh, okay, so. In this, uh, I mean, this formulation, this thing is uh, hopelessly general, right? I mean, you cannot just look at any action whatsoever. I mean, so for example, if you look at, uh, I mean, a very simple thing, if you take m equal to g and g discrete, right? so you take g some discrete group, uh, infinite, and you take m equal to g, so g acts on itself by left translation, then what you obtain is, well, g acting on 0, 1 to the g. Uh, and, well, it is a well-known fact that if you start with any measure preserving action of G, you can find a measure here, such that this shift action with this measure exactly models the initial action, so that they're isomorphic as a dynamic system. And it is also well known that uh, classifying all, G all ergodic G dynamical systems measure theoretic, this is a hopeless task. And there are many precisely precise results of uh, this type coming from descriptive set theory, not classifiable countable structures, whatnot. I mean, so it's, this is, Really, one cannot hope in a description in this in this very simple case. Yeah, even if you take g equal to the integers, for example. Uh, so okay, so we want to make some sort of assumption here so that we actually have a have a hope to uh, to to do this. And you see, so the theorem, so the original theorem, the Finetti's theorem, this is the strongest possible thing, right? You had the group of all permutations. I mean, the thing is that the bigger the group is, the easier it will be to classify the things because the measures become fewer. So this was the biggest possible case. And then the question is, okay, so maybe we can still reduce the group a little bit. I mean, look at a smaller group, maybe keep the same, the same conclusion, or maybe also change the conclusion. Okay, so we'll, we'll look into this. Uh, okay, so what, what we're going to make for the rest of this talk, we're going to make uh, the assumption that the action of G on M, so main assumption, okay, let me write it here. And hopefully, well, in front of this audience, I don't have to justify this assumption. <laughs> so the main assumption will be that uh, the action is oligomorphic, yeah? Main assumption is that the action of G on M is oligomorphic. Uh, okay, so this means that uh, the action on all powers of M has only finitely many orbits. Now let's put it like this. M then divided by G is finite for all M. Okay, so this is a uh, this is a largeness assumption of G inside the symmetry group of M. Okay, so this is the same thing as to say that the symmetry group of M divided by G is pre-compact. Okay, so it's somehow you say that G is large inside this group. And, uh, well, okay. So the, the hope that I have is it will actually be possible to may more or less completely classify those invariant measures under this assumption. So for the moment, I have not been able to achieve this. But, uh, well, at least, I mean, I'll tell you a few things about what I think should be true and also some of the things that uh, I can prove. Uh, all right. Okay, so this is, right, I mean, uh, every time you have a G acting on M, you can take, I mean, it's the same thing as take, taking some omega categorical structure. Uh, okay, I can as well assume that G is closed in, this, in the symmetry group of M. Right, this will not change the, the invariant measures. 
So I can as well assume that G is a closed subgroup, so that I can use my, my model theory. Uh, okay, so M is <coughs> omega categorical structure, and then G will be the automorphism group. Yeah, the automorphism group of that line. So this is exactly, it's exactly the same setting. Uh, oh, but now, okay. Uh, well, first of all, because this is more general. I mean, so this is what you really want to do. And second, more important uh, reason is that when you actually carry inductive proofs and things like this, you actually need the general measure space at the bottom. So I mean, this, is, this is really the natural question. I mean, there's no reason to restrict yourself to two. Because then you can ask the next question, what about three? Right? I mean, the thing is, of course, okay, this question, if you have an uncountable space, this includes all finite spaces as well, right? You, have, you can have measures here that are supported on two points. So. Um, okay, so this is, um, I, mean, I should say that all of this comes from probability theory. I mean, even if don't, I mean, the way that I'm presenting it, it doesn't quite sound like it. But uh, maybe I should also give you a sort of probabilistic formulation of, of this, of the problem at least. So wh what we have, we have uh, Xa, A, and M. Yeah, those are uh, random variables. Yeah, so they're random variables indexed by an omega categorical structure M. Yeah, random. Variables. And then what we know about their distribution is that whenever the type of A is the same as the type of B, right? So A and B are some tuples in M. Well, okay. So the measure is, I have this mystery measure, right? So okay, let's, let's put it like here, yeah? So mu is the mystery measure here, which I try to identify. And then the random variables that I wrote there. Uh, they're just the, the projections, right? So it's just the proje projection maps for each A. I have the projection on 0, 1. Okay? Uh, yes, I mean, for, for a single A, I just have one projection. And then for, for many of them, yes, I have, I, 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 I'm going to say this. So the condition is that uh, whenever A and B have the same type, then the distribution of C A1 up to C A n is the same as the distribution of C B1, C B N. Okay? So I have uh, somehow have random variables indexed by my omega categorical structure, and then this is a very natural condition. Okay, so whenever two tuples have the same type, I look at the joint distribution of this, those the corresponding random variables, and then the other ones, and I assume they're equal. Okay? And then so and this is my assumption, and then I want to somehow conclude, I want to well, decide what what are the possible measures that would satisfy this. Uh, okay, so this, this is somehow maybe closer to the original probabilistic approach, I mean, to this, uh, to this thing. Okay. Uh, all right, so I'll, I think I'll need, I need a few more definitions. So let me do this. Okay, so, so M is, is our structure. It is, it is here. So now there's this thing which is called uh, MEQ which I suppose uh, all model theorists already know, so I'm going to give the definition using the, using the group. Right? So MEQ, this is by definition, this is the set of all, well, set of equivalence classes. Of G invariant equivalence relations. on G invariant subsets of M to the K. Well, for, well, for OK, right? I mean, okay, can I write this for, for some K, for any K? How about this? So it's basically this joint union, right? For f so for every K, you take of all equivalence relations which are on G invariant subsets of M to the K, and then you take the disjoint union of all of those for all the Ks. And because, uh, because M uh, was omega categorical, or if you want this group is oligomorphic, this implies uh, right away that this set is countable. Okay. So this, this is a countable set. And then, of course, the uh, G acts on, on this. And I mean, it's, it comes with the with action of G. Uh, and then uh, another thing. 
is that uh, what I want to say? Okay. Ah, yes. Okay. So what? Another thing which is important about this uh, MEQ is that this is a canonical object which is really associated to the group. I mean, the thing is that even if I start with two M1 and M2, which are a priori two different structures, and then I, but they have the same automorphism group. Somehow they have isomorphic automorphism group. Then when I obtain those M1 EQ and M2 EQ, they will be the same, just as, as G spaces. So this is really a canonical object which is associated to the group, and this is really something that you want to consider somehow. So this is important. Uh, okay. And then another, okay. So an, another definition that should also be useful. So what is uh, algebraic closure? I suppose this appeared several times already, but I'll still define this. So if A, say, is a tuple in, uh, well, let's say if A is a subset of M, let's do it like this. So if A is a subset of M, Uh, then the algebraic closure of A, this is by definition, so the union of O, uh, so this is the algebraic closure, this is a subset of M, right? So this is the union of O, union of O finite G A orbits in M. Right, so GA is the stabilizer of your finite set A. This is an open subgroup of your group. Then you look at all of the finite orbits, you take all of them, and then you call this the algebraic closure of A. Okay? And this is uh, because, again, of our omega categoricity assumption. If A was finite in the beginning, this would be a finite set. Okay? And then another thing that I want is this, well, the same thing, but uh, the algebraic closure, this time in MEQ of A. Well, so it's exactly the same thing, except that now, I take all the finite orbits in MEQ. Okay, so somehow the group is the same, right? I mean, the group that I care about is still the stabilizer of this set A. But now, of course, MEQ, this is a much bigger thing. Of course, M embeds in MEQ. Yeah, maybe I should, did I mention this? That, so M to the N embeds in MEQ for every N. Yeah, this is because I take the trivial equivalence relation on M to the, M to the N. Okay, so I call it M to the K, I suppose. Uh, okay. So this is, I mean, this, this thing is bigger set than the one here. And this one need not always be finite. Okay, but, well, it's somewhat painful, but it well, can happen. Yes. Uh, so uh, well, okay, so another thing you can, you can do is you can, it's not the set of all open subgroups, really. I mean, what I want is the set of all cosets of open subgroups. So the set of all left cosets of open subgroups. And then this is more or less the same thing. Okay? This will be enough. But somehow this is, well, you know, this is easier to visualize. And there are also, I mean, there are some model theories in the audience. Am I doing something wrong? <laughs> 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 it's just always a very amusing thing to watch. Yeah. Oh, I think it's more or less. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it will be all right. Uh, okay. <coughs> so, what do I want to say? Yeah, I think I have actually all the definitions. Okay, so I'll, now I'll tell you what I think more or less uh, should be true. And then uh, you should allow, so this is not, what I'm going to state is not really a theorem. So you should also allow minor variations that, I mean, may not, not be true exactly as stated, but maybe you have to change a few things in a sort of reasonable way. Okay. So what we start with, we start with uh, 
this space 0 1 to the m e q and then here we take the Lebesgue measure we just take the product measure here okay so okay and this is how this is Lebesgue measure we take we take the product measure and now I'm going to define a map from this so this is yeah, so our initial setup was 0 1 to the m with some mystery measure mu and the only thing we know about the mystery measure is it's invariant by uh, it is invariant by the action of the group okay so now I'm going to define a map here f which goes from here to here it will be a G map so it will be compatible with the group action and then it will push down this measure to the measure mu Okay, basically, I'm going to define a way that to produce invariant measures using this. And then I'm going to pretend that this is actually oh, what should be true, is that those are really all measures. I mean, you cannot obtain anything else. OK, so now let me explain what f is a g map. Yes, f is a g equivariant map, which I haven't defined yet, but I'm going to. Okay. Uh, yes, I mean, the thing is that th this thing, so the procedure that I'm going to describe, it is always going to define some, in, some invariant measure here. So the, the what I really want is that actually every measure, if you start with any measure, it's obtained in this way. No, the definition doesn't involve me. The definition only involves F. Okay, so. I mean, the data somehow, the data to define uh, this f. Okay, so I'm also make, going to make some simplifying assumptions, which I don't think are essential, but will help me describe this. So simplifying assumptions. Okay, uh, are the following things. Okay, so there are three things, I suppose. So first of all, the action of g on m is transitive. And this is just, just a notation, otherwise I'll have to introduce more notation, which I don't really want to do. So this means that there's just one one type. Okay, uh, then second thing is that the algebraic closure of the empty set is empty. Okay, so this just means that there are no open subgroups of G of finite index. And three, I'm going to assume that uh, the algebraic closure in EQ of every element is finite, yeah, finite. For every a in m. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure this is not necessary, but it uh, it makes me. I mean, it makes me feel better. <laughs> but, but I agree that so all of those assumptions are inessential. Uh, okay. So now I give myself so a zero. I fix some set uh, some point a zero in m. It doesn't matter which one because the action is transitive. And now I give myself a map small f, which is defined from 0, 1 to the this set. So the EQ algebraic closure of A0 to 0, 1. Okay. So this, uh, I suppose that this is finite, right? Uh, here, so this is just a map if you want a finitely many variables. I mean, it's a function of finitely many variables, which is uh, supposed to be measurable. This is the only. Uh, the only condition. And this is an arbitrary function. Well, okay, it's not quite. I'll put some condition here later. But, uh, okay. And now I'm going to define the big F. All right, using this small f, this is my initial data. I'm going to using this to define the, the big F. So how do I do it? Oh, well, I take. So F is defined on this big space. So I give myself an element omega, which is here. All right, so I want to define what F of omega is. So f of omega is supposed to be an element here. So an element here is a function from m to 0, 1. So I want to say what is f of omega evaluated at a point a. Well, so what do I do? Uh, so I look, let me write it down. Okay. So now I look, I have this point a. I mean, I mean, the way to imagine this is that I have this, right? I mean, this, I have this a point here, which is just basically a, a number, a random number written at every element of MEQ. And then I want to define some sort of random process, I don't know, a procedure to, to decide, okay, I want now from this data to decide a number which I associate to A and want to do this in invariant fashion. 
So what I do is I look around this map, and I look at the things which are in my algebraic closure, yeah, which is somehow a finite local set around me. I look at those points, and then I'm allowed to, based on the, what I see, to make a decision what my value is going to be. Yeah, this is the function f. And then the point is, of course, that no matter where I am, and this is invariant, right? So the, I use the same decision procedure for every, for every point, so this will be a, this will be a G map. Right, so this is, I mean, and this is clear. Right? So there is one, uh, one minor problem with this. That when you see here is the algebraic closure of A0, and here this is, uh, I somehow evaluate the algebraic closure of A. And even though those two things are somehow the same, I mean, they're isomorphic, but they're not equal, right? I mean, this is A0, which was a fixed point, and this is just A, which is allowed to vary. So I really want to be able to actually evaluate this, which is not well defined at the moment. I have to identify this thing, the, a, the algebraic closure of A with the algebraic closure of A0. And this I can do in several ways, right? So the thing is that I, can, I have to map A to A0, but then this algebraic closure, it can it may have some sort of automorphism. I mean, it can make, make me to flip something. And then I really want that this, I mean, that what I do doesn't, doesn't matter, okay? So I want this map F to be invariant under uh, the automorphism group of the algebraic closure of, well, A0 over A0, right? So that no matter how I map it, I'll get the same result. And now that I have done this, this ensures that this big F is a G map. It's a G, it's a G homomorphism from this space to this space. So the push forward of this measure is some measure here. Okay, now it's a different question that, I mean, that all measures should be obtained like this. But, uh, okay, so maybe I should say, so this is, does not come out of... Com ergodic ones. Uh, ergodic ones, yes. Yeah, okay, so you see, I mean, that's why I made some, uh, I mean, maybe I should justify some of my assumptions. So, for example, the, well, the first assumption just allows me to define only one F. Otherwise, I have to define many Fs. If I have many orbits, I'll have different one for every orbit. This is one thing. Uh, then this thing here, the first one, assures that uh, this measure here is ergodic, okay? Because otherwise, uh, I will not have an ergodic measure here, so there's no hope to obtain ergodic measure at the bottom. And the third assumption basically ensures that this group by which I divide there is finite. Otherwise, it will be compact. It will still be okay, but I don't want to get into this. So F is F does not depend on anything. I mean, F depends on the small f. I mean, uh, capital F. Capital F only depends on the small, small f. Uh, yes, the uh, f is defined like this. So you must use f, uh, f. Yeah, I mean, I use the same letter, so it's well, okay. Yeah, I mean, the big, uh, the big f is supposed this is defined from the small f. So the claim would be okay. So the what kind of should be true, or at least again, I mean, I may maybe willing to allow minor variations of this. Okay, so I'm not 100% sure in my statement. But Here you want EQ, right? The other more group of the EQ is. But yes, uh, that's right, yes. There is an EQ here. Okay. So the claim, I mean, sh should be that for O mu, there exists a small f such that now the big F of the small f lambda is equal to mu. Uh, so in particular, this would mean that uh, this, this dynamical system here, right, this MEQ, this only depends on G, as I said. It does not depend on M. So this would be somehow a universal dynamical system for G. Right? This would be just a, a system of which every other system is a factor. At least every other system of this type, but it doesn't matter much. Uh, okay. All right. So uh, I mean, this, this sort of thing is not completely arbitrary. Okay? There are many cases which are actually known. Of this. I mean, even before, before I started working. Right, so um, let me see. Okay, so known cases. <laughs> okay, so first, of course, okay, I mean, uh, just give different uh, different things of m. Okay, so if you take m equal to the natural numbers and then the group s infinity, okay, this is the finite sphere. Uh, right, because then what happens? Then uh, in this case, if you just have uh, the integer, so the, the, those things are indexed, right? Your, your m is just the, the set. Then the algebraic EQ closure of A0 is just equal to A0. And there's nothing else in the algebraic closure. So your map F is only on one variable. And it's only allowed, I mean, so it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, so, so you have only a map on one variable. 
And then the only thing which matters here is the m, right? All the other, the higher things in m e q are completely irrelevant because your function never depends on them. So what you get is that there is a map here from this thing to this thing that is basically coordinate by coordinate. So this tells you that, well, the measure is just the product of the f star lambda. Yeah? Okay, so this is what the finitist theory actually tells you in this, in this context. Uh, all right, so example two, if you take uh, m, maybe I should do them in order. So m equal to q, I mean this is in chronological order. This was somewhere in the 30s, I think. So the next one is, uh, this is m equal to q, this is the theorem of Friunerzewski. In the 60s maybe. Uh, uh, with the ordering. Okay, so this is uh, Friunerzewski. Uh, I should say that he does not formulate the theorem in this uh, language, so it may not be completely obvious to translate, but it's possible. Okay, and then the same conclusion. Yeah, so the conclusion is again that if you have things which are indexed by Q, they have to be independent. Right? There is no uh, there is no non-trivial MUQ which takes which takes part, so n nothing nothing happens. Yeah? Um, all right, so this is the theorem of Friedman-Zewski. Then a third version, you take M is equal to, let's do it like this, and K. Uh, or maybe nk. So this is, by definition, is the set of all k element subsets of n. Yeah, so this is a subset of n. a is equal to k. Right, so this is, a, the group here is again s-infinity. Except that now your structure contains not points, but k element subsets of n. Yeah, this falls, I mean, falls in this, uh, this framework. Um, Okay, and then, so this is, so this again, those are known in there of this form. I'll, I'll explain actually, maybe this will be pedagogical to explain how to get this in this very special case, how to get the known theorems from the, uh, from this general nonsense. Uh, let's see. So here this is for k equal to 2, it's due to Aldous. For k bigger than 2, I suppose it's due to Hoover. Maybe I should put equal and then this the proof of Hoover was never published and no one understood it and then I think the first published proof is due to Kallenberg <coughs> but uh, by far the most readable proof is uh, the one of Tim Austin from a few years ago which is really the only one which I could read so, no idea. so the the citation is some uh, manuscript from Princeton University that's it. So I suppose it's stored in the library of Princeton University. So I never had a look at it. I mean, <laughs> is it? I mean, oh, okay. Maybe we can talk later about. Yeah. But, uh, okay. All right. And then uh, finally, I mean, the final, I suppose, known case is uh, when you take well, the same thing, but instead of n to the k, you take q to the k. And now this is due to Kallenberg. Okay. For for okay. Uh, so the, this one, so the statement, the original statement of the theorem is that if x1, x2, and so on are random variables that have the property that their distribution of xi1 up to xin is the same as the distribution of xj1, xjn when they're ordered in the same way. Uh, okay, you know this for all n and for all n and jn, then the random variables are independent if the measure is ergodic. And then to pass from this uh, index set, I mean, from things indexed by the integer to things indexed by the rationals, I mean, there is some easy trick involved, which is kind of standard. 
Okay. Oh no, because I cannot prove this. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, oh no, okay. I mean, I can. So, in particular Elder's theorem. So, in this case, in the case of S infinity, I do actually have a proof of this, which is somewhat different from the known proof. So, one which actually what I cannot. Okay, I mean, I'll tell you. I think in the last maybe five minutes, I'll tell you what I can do of this, which is not very much, but. At least, I mean, so the, I mean, the known cases I can do all of the one except the q to the k. I mean, this is. Uh, I think if I can do this one, I can probably do everything. Somehow using the, this is still a problem. Uh, okay. Oh, um, maybe I should say so. How what, what happens? Okay, let, let's take uh, this simple case and just do it quickly. To see what the statement is in a concrete situation. Okay, to actually make some sense of this. So you take m equal to n squared, g is equal to s infinity. Okay, so then what is uh, what is MEQ in this case, right? So, I mean, the thing is that MEQ is always a, a very big thing, right? I mean, there are all of those uh, all powers and all, all things like this. But really what is essential is what can be in the algebraic closure of an element which is here, right? I mean, all the other part of MEQ is irrelevant because it's never used. So the point is, what are the imaginaries that can be used? Okay, so our, our points, right? The points in our structure are just, I mean, there are somehow two element subsets of them. Oh, there may be, and some of them can share, right, an element. And then in the important imaginaries here are actually the points of n, right? I mean, those are the points of n, which are not in our structure, but they can be defined as the imaginaries here, okay? I, now, should I do this? Okay, I think I will not do this. Okay, so you believe me that the points, the points in the integers can be defined as imaginary elements in this structure. Okay, so this, I mean, can define a gene variant subset of the square of this, and then an equivalence relation on this, which gives you exactly this. Okay, all right. And then, of course, the point is, so this is, this is a part of MEQ. I mean, this, and this is really the only relevant part. And then, of course, there's M itself. So now, if, what is the algebraic closure in of say the set uh, one two, right? So this is so we look at the stabilizer of the point of the set one two, uh, and then what are what things have finite orbit? Well, first of all, this thing of course has a finite orbit; it's fixed. But then there are also the two imaginaries, namely the imaginary one and the imaginary two. Both of them have orbit of size two, right? Because this is just the stabilizer of the set, so it's allowed to switch them. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is just equal to the set one two, and then one, and then two. Okay, so there are three things. Okay, so now our function, the small function f there, we will have three variables, right? So f will be defined somehow of say x one two, x one, and x two. And now this function, it has to be invariant under this group which are out there. Okay? <laughs> so what is the group in this case? Well, the group is the group that fixes this, and then it's an automorphism group of this three-point set. So we can just switch one and two, right? So this is the automorphism group in this case. This is the automorphism group of, well, of this a zero over a zero. This is just the group of order two that switches those two elements. Okay. So now we have a function f from in, in three variables two zero one, which is has the property that it is symmetric when we exchange the last two variables. So it's the same as f is two x two x one. We start with an arbitrary function like this. Then we look at this, this thing over there. So now we get, right, we forget the irrelevant part of MEQ. Uh, okay, so we get, basically we get M, which is was the, I mean, just kind of N squared, right? This was the M. And then we also get uh, those, the, somehow the relevant imaginaries, which are N. So we get the map from here with this, with the, I mean, with the product of the, of the Lebesgue measure, which is defined uh, using this, and then we get to get the map down. We get, the, I mean, we get the measure, and this is exactly the statement of Aldous' theorem. I mean, in this, in this case. Okay. So I mean, and again, what I pretend that should be true is that some sort, uh, 
something like this should code in general. Okay, now let me tell you why, why I, I mean, why would I believe such a thing? That's maybe it. Uh, okay, so the, the approach that I have to, to attack this problem passes through unitary representations. So a few, well, a few years ago, yeah, I mean, I, I classified the, the unitary representations of all of those groups, G, that, uh, that appear like this. And then, of course, I mean, the point is that every time you have, right, you have an, so we have G acting on this 0, 1 to the M with this mystery measure mu. And then you immediately obtain a unitary representation from this, uh, which is just you take the L2, right? You take all the L2 functions defined on this measure space. And this is 0, 1 to the M, and then mu. And this is a Hilbert space. And I know what the actions on the Hilbert space look like. Okay, so in this case, I mean, well, I only want to use actually one thing, so that this will be a sub-representation. So you can view this as a sub-representation of L2 of M E Q. Maybe you want to take an infinite sum here. I mean, it really depends how you define the M E Q in the beginning, but it doesn't matter too much. So basically every, so on the level of the unitary representation, everything that happens here, you can view it, yeah, you, can view it uh, you can view it here. And using only this, well, I can show well, kind of a somewhat silly special case of this theorem, uh, which, is, which is the following that, well, suppose that th those things are trivial, okay? Suppose that this algebraic closure is actually just trivial. So suppose that uh, the algebraic closure of Q of A is just equal to A, okay? As is the case in the Finetti's theorem, as is the case in Rionerzewski's theorem, as would be the case, say, if you look at things indexed by the random graph or by the partial ordering or by whatnot. I mean, all of those familiar structures, they would have this property that points have, I mean, their algebraic closure is trivial, okay? So it would apply to all of those groups. It will not apply to tuples of those groups, right? And because when you want to pass to them, then you actually need, need all, of, all of this, okay? So this is unfortunately, I mean, this is somehow the interesting part of the theorem, which, okay, for the moment, it's, it's not clear. Okay, but at least, so if we have this, uh, then you can actually prove that, uh, well, they're, they're independent. And well, maybe, how, how long do I have? 10 minutes? Yes. Okay, so maybe I can actually prove this. For, okay, so instead of this, let me make a slightly different assumption, which I think is the same, but I don't want to embarrass myself. So let's, okay. <laughs> uh, so I want, uh, the assumption that I want to make is that for A and B, subsets of M, finite, Uh, then if A and B are disjoint, this would imply that the algebraic closure of A and the algebraic closure of B are also disjoint. But the algebraic closure in uh, MEQ. Okay? I think this should follow from this, but uh, I only tried to check this this afternoon, and I think I checked it, but okay, yes. So this is what I actually know how, okay, so this is the assumption that I want to officially make. Okay, again, I mean, it, it would apply to, so the finite EQ, I don't know, random graph, partial ordering, all of those things. I mean, this, this applies. Uh, okay, so now, how, how do you want to prove this, right? So we, want, we have those uh, random variables which are indexed. Somehow we have those uh, C A's for A in M. Um, oh, and we want to prove that they're independent. So we know that the measure is ergodic. Okay, so it suffices to show. So suffices to show. Okay, maybe I want to do something first. So instead of looking at this, uh, this L2, I will look at uh, this L20, yeah, which is the same thing. So L20 is the all sets, all functions f in L2 that are orthogonal to the constants. Okay, so this is the integral of f is equal to zero. I mean, the thing is that uh, there is a trivial fixed point in this, uh, in this representation, which I really want to ignore. I mean, it doesn't give me, give me no information, so I want to get rid of it. So I look at the, what remains. And now here is the important part of the ergodicity assumption, which tells you that here there are no more fixed points. Okay, so here there is no function which is fixed by the group. And yeah, this is the ergodicity assumption that I started with in the, in the beginning. Okay, so I get, I mean, uh, so I'm really a subspace of this representation. There is, I mean, how somehow the, the trivial representation does not appear here. In this. Okay, so now I start with two A and B, which are disjoint. 
like there. So A and B are the joint. And then maybe I have some, some function. How do I want to call this? Maybe eta A, which is some function of the C A A in A. <laughs> and then I also have another eta B, which is some other function of, of the C Bs, B in B. Okay? So now to prove, right? I mean, I want to prove that, uh, so what? So what I really want to prove is that somehow the sigma field generated by the C A is for A in A, and the sigma field generated by C B for B and B, for these joint sets A and B, that those things are independent. Right? This is what, I mean, this is what independence means. I, you can verify it on finite sets. Uh, okay, so for this it is enough that if I take somehow arbitrary functions, okay, maybe f1 and f2 here. So I take two arbitrary functions of the Xa's. So this is a function which is measurable in this sigma field. And another function which is measurable in this sigma field. And both of them have integral zero. I want to verify that uh, the product has integral zero. This is enough. So what I want, so this is the assumption. Okay, so at the a and at the b are in my space, L2. Uh, okay, so I have uh, so one to show that uh, well the inner product. I mean the inner product is the integral of the product uh, at the a at the b is equal to zero. Yeah, given that I mean both so given that both at the a and at the b are in L two zero. Right, so I know that the integral of those, both of them is zero. I want to show that the integral of the product is zero. And this is enough. Uh, OK. So now I look at uh, this thing here, right? I mean, so <laughs> viewing this representation as a sub-representation of this representation, it gives me a form of a Fourier transform, if you want. Yeah? So for each function which is on the left, I have, I can define this at a hat, which is now a function from n e q to, well, to the complex numbers themselves, right? So this is the this is the function, right? I mean, here I have a function which is on this space, but this space is a subspace here, so I can view it also as a function here, on this. I mean, this is what the Fourier transform is in the classical case. So every time you know the representations, it is something like this. Okay, so I have this this function now here, and then I have this other one, which is also here, m e q to c. Okay, and now suppose that this what is written here is false. Okay, suppose that this is not zero. Okay, then there there exists a C in M E Q uh, such that well, at the A of C is different from zero, and at the B of C is different from zero. And I mean, there, if the inner product is not is not the same, well, there's at least one point in which both of them are not zero. Oh, there's a hat, yes, thank you. Okay. Well, but now I'm going to use something. So the, this uh, eta a was a function of those xa's, right, which are for a in a. So in particular, this is fixed by this very big group, ga. Okay, so I know that ga times eta a, or I can put this, of course, because the action is the same, is the same as eta a, so it's fixed by this big group, and then similarly for the b. At the B is in at the B. Um, okay, so this means now that this function here, which is, it is actually constant on every orbit of this group, right? Because this group it acts here by just permuting the MEQ. So this function is in fact constant on the whole orbit. Well, but it's non-zero, and this is a function in L two. Which means that has to be, I mean, the set, the orbit has to be finite. It cannot be a, a positive constant on an infinite set. Okay? So this is actually a finite. So, conclusion here is that GAC is finite. And we also, same conclusion for B, okay? GBC is finite. Okay, but this is no good, yeah? Because we assumed somewhere that the algebraic closures of uh, A and B, they do not intersect. 
Okay, so this, uh, this finishes, I suppose it finishes this proof. And then as you see, I mean, the disargument is actually quite general. I mean, I, a lot more things can be derived from this. I mean, some sort of conditional independence of various things and so on, which are exactly the things that hold there, except that. What's the conclusion? Oh, the conclusion is that they're independent. Sorry? They are independent. So the CAs. Ah. So uh, conclusion that, so conclusion, we write it here, the CAs are independent. Right, so again, from this very strong assumption, okay, this very strong assumption on the structure. Yeah? Oh, yeah, I mean, again, so I, if I weaken the assumption, then I weaken the conclusion, so I get a lot more from this argument, but this is really the, well, the thing that I can do in 10 minutes on the board. <laughs> uh, and, well, I think, yeah, this is probably a good place to stop. Thank you very much. Yes, so I don't know about this. So this is, I mean, this is the next natural question that I'd want to ask, I think. Anatoly knows a lot about this. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, this is the same as his classification of measurable functions, I think. But I don't know in which situations he can do it. No, so I, I haven't thought about this at all. So, I mean, first, I mean, now we want to have this representation theorem, and then I agree that, I mean, really the next thing that you want to know is exactly when you have two different small apps when they give you right to the same measure at the bottom. I haven't thought about this, but I think somehow the aesthetic appeal of the picture, perhaps, but I first I want to prove it. Sure. But I think, I mean, that this is, for me, that this is definitely motivating by itself. What is uh, rotatability? Is just a circular order? Yeah. That's like yeah, then uh, surely you get this. I mean, it's, it's an oligomorphic group, right? So every time you have, right, I mean, this is the, the very general condition in the beginning, that just G on M is oligomorphic. This is the only thing that you need, presumably. Okay, and then if you really want a theorem, you also have to assume this. <laughs> So maybe I shouldn't call it Fourier transform, but what it means is that, so this representation is isomorphic to a sub-representation here. And this, so to every function here, corresponds a function at the hat, which is a function like this. I mean, it just doesn't matter. I mean, I don't know how you can cal calculate it. I mean, I know you take the inner product, right? I mean, well, then you have, have to figure out what, what the basis vector here corresponds to things here. Well, you, you can figure this out. I mean, there's a certain product of certain, I mean, this is kind of standard stuff. 
Well, I suppose it depends on the measure. So it's not so clear. In the case, OK, in the mystery measure, of course, there's no way to say. But if your measure is actually comes from a product, then you can calculate everything explicitly. OK, you can have Fourier, Fourier formulas, Fourier inversion formulas, and whatnot. Of course, for a mystery measure, you cannot say anything. But I don't need it. I mean, I just want this. Yeah. As to this representation, of course, it's well known situation. Thank the organizers, including Anatoly, maybe this time. <laughs> 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 sure, I'm, I'm here for two weeks. Okay. How long will you be here? Two weeks. Uh, two weeks? Oh.